I'm Vicki Johnson Dahl, and you may remember me from such an ACES talks as How Far is a Sandwich, and it's a map, 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 map world. Um, my first ever NASIS talk was actually in this room uh, at the last Minneapolis conference, so it's great to be back. Um, because I wrote a book, uh, and that's researched, wrote, uh, and designed the maps for. And the writing is actually the least relevant part of this talk. Um, you can hear more about that at the next meeting of the North American Map Describers Information Society, or something like that. Uh, the book is called Buffalo and 50 Maps. Uh, and it's out next spring from Belt Publishing. Belt Publishing is a woman-founded and worker-owned publishing company based in the Slavic Village, Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, and my book is the third in the series. Cleveland and Detroit and 50 Maps uh, are already out. I have those here, and I'll pass them around. Um, so if you came here hoping for tips on how to get a book deal, I can't really help you with that, um, because I got it by being really into Buffalo and being a kind of unhinged windbag about it on Twitter. Um, my pal Will Scora, a web and web cartography dabbler and community helper in Cleveland, happens to know the publisher, saw that they were looking to expand the series to Buffalo, and knew that I am a cartographer, am from Buffalo, and I'm loud about both. Uh, pointed me in their direction, and that's all it took. Uh, so the first thing I did after signing the book contract was panic. I'm an okay writer, um, I've been published before, and I do some internal documentation at work, but that's for the internet or completely internal, which means they can be tweaked and adjusted. And a book is like printed on paper. Uh, you get one shot to get that right. Uh, so the second thing I did was make a plan because writing a book, there's a lot more spreadsheets than you might expect. Um, but the first thing I did, well, I guess the second thing I did was just start listing ideas, just concepts. Uh, I went through like 120 concepts of just what could be a map in this book. What would I want to see? Um, and I, then I added a notes column and went through and kind of spitballed what it would take to make that idea into a map. And that's, does the data exist? How could I find or create the data? Uh, who do I need to talk to? And what already exists in the incredibly broad spheres of Buffalo and maps? Um, so I cast a really wide net. Uh, I was in Chicago for a day and a half before the NASA spring meeting in Milwaukee. Oh, better see what's up at the Newberry Library and their amazing Rand McNally map room. Uh, and this is the library in scale model format. And when you're doing research, you're going to encounter so many seemingly irrelevant things. And many of them will surprise you later uh, down the road by how useful they will be. Uh, so make sure you take really good notes and be ready to have really complete citations for sourcing. Uh, but there are some things that won't necessarily be useful later. They're just cool and unexpected. Uh, and you know, just file these under good background. Um, something that won't be immediately present in the text, but it adds depth to your own understanding of something. Um, for example, uh, this book, which in the moment, in my hands, I was thinking like, oh wow, this is going to make a great NASIS talk. And it only ended up as like two slides, but whatever. Uh, it's an automobile club touring guide from 1914, and vehicle adoption was pretty new then, so navigation, they had these books, and it's all turn-by-turn -turn directions from one place to another. Uh, and it's not substantially different from modern GPS, but there is real charm to looking in 2022 at so how someone would get from Buffalo to East Aurora or Elma or wherever in 1914 by following wires or noting that there's a large chicken farm on the right. Um, not to turn there, just confirmation that you're going in the right direction. Uh, but one thing that modern navigation systems are lacking that they had back then, interesting detours. It's just... There's a couple of these sprinkled throughout the book of just like, there's an excellent view of the falls if you go this way. Um, also missing from modern uh, navigation systems, liquor ads, uh, different times. So the thing holding the book open also, um, that's called a snake and I love niche jargon. Uh, the lovely li research librarian when I was getting these books was just like, oh, do you want a snake? We've got snakes. She's like, yeah. I'll take a snake. Uh, I was really relieved when it was a velvet tube that holds the book open without damaging it and not a live cobra. 
The other major library uh, I visited was the library at the Buffalo History Museum, uh, which is the only building still standing from the Pan American Exhibition of 1901. And they have a wonderful research library. Um, and this is where I'm taking a hard left into how amazing research libraries and librarians are. Um, the director of the library and archives of the Buffalo History Museum is this fabulous woman named Cynthia Van Ness. Uh, and kind of the crazy thing about research libraries, anyone can go. <laughs> They're not walled gardens. These are not gate-kept spaces. There's all these amazing materials and knowledge and history just hanging out, gathering dust, waiting for someone to uncover it and, and learn from it all, all over again. Um, the other person in the research library when I was there was a guy trying to find a news article from a car accident he had been in, in a teen, uh, as a teenager to scare his own teenager into driving safe. Like, <laughs> you can just go in and do stuff like that. Um, but cartographers, we are a, a curious bunch. And it's so rewarding and inspiring um, to remind ourselves that we are part of a, a grand tradition with a really long history. And we come to NASIS really to share our best work, but sometimes it's the more quotidian work that will really grab someone. Um, like this stamp only labels the most important place. Uh, and this is also where contextual information is really important because sometimes you are just left wondering. I have no idea what that map's showing. Um, but now I'm just gonna heave us back on track to my book um, and the kind of research involved with that. Uh, this is one of the, this is the first map I made for the book. Uh, and it's from a data set compiled by the aforementioned Cynthia Van Ness um, who run, runs a research website about Buffalo in her spare time. She, she's like a cartographer in that we do things for work and then we do more for fun. She is a research librarian and then does research of her own on the side, completely unaffiliated. Um, anyway, she noticed a pattern, uh, and this is one of my favorite maps because she calls Buffalo the world capital of cars driving into buildings. She noticed a, a pattern in the news that it seems to happen a lot in Buffalo. So she tracked um, like 20 years of every building that a driver had hit. Um, I don't know, I find it very entertaining and very unique to Buffalo. Uh, but that's a ready-made data set. Uh, another interesting uh, set of maps, another ready-made data set, and this is just roads from the city's open data portal, broken out by type. We have streets and avenues. Um, and in the book, there's also roads and highways um, to kind of highlight the spatial distribution. But this is unusual. Many cities have streets going one way and avenues going another not Buffalo. Uh, Buffalo streets and roads were named as the city expanded. So whoever lived on those streets at the time got to name the streets. So you can actually see like naming trends in the city's expansion, how uh, the last parts of the city to be, uh, to ha have residents are the avenues, whereas the center of the city is all streets. And that's just kind of following the vogue at the time. Um, and the research here, because uh, you see this pattern, you wonder why, um, brought me to Angela Keppel, a city planner who runs a whole blog dedicated to Buffalo streets called buffalostreets.com. And it's a really fascinating, really different way to kind of understand a place because you're taking it literally from the pavement up. Um, here's another uh, kind of application of a ready-made data set. And this is Housing Age. And it's one of my favorite maps just for the variety of stories you can tell with it as the foundation. Uh, Buffalo Open Data has these tax assessment roles and it's all kinds of publicly available information about every residential address, including things like home style and when the structure was built. So this is uh, house age groupings, just when the structure was built. And you can absolutely follow the path of city growth here. But you can also see that as the city has declined in population, Buffalo has not seen the kinds of redevelopment that cities with a more uh, upward trajectory um, have taken. So Buffalo has this really rich architectural history and beyond the more notable Frank Lloyd Wright, Louise Blanthard Bethune design buildings, the homes themselves are often uh, real treasures. Uh, sidebar, this map took forever to make, not because it was very complex, because there's just so many dots and my computer's very slow. Um, if you want to explore the data, uh, it's on felt, and you can get the, the broad picture and the very zoomed in picture. It's a really cool data set. Um, I had a lot of fun putting that in felt. Uh, but like I was saying about the residential architecture, there are a lot of really gorgeous homes. Uh, Millionaire's Row here is a stretch of incredible ornate mansions and one stunning modernist synagogue. But when you look at the data, um, 
all the mansions are really clustered. There's like really just one area where there are these mansions. Um, and Buffalo is and always has been a very proudly working class town. Um, even the city's wealthiest, labor is the backbone of the city. Um, and you know, the first unionized Starbucks was in Buffalo. Labor still is uh, very important in Buffalo. Um, but the double is a sort of balloon frame vertical duplex. Um, and it allowed average workers to own property and keep a family unit together in two separate homes in the same structure or allow um, the owners to rent out one of the units and then it allowed the renters to have a more private space with a lawn and parking, um, which you don't really get in an apartment building. And to this day, there are just not a lot of apartment buildings in Buffalo because there are so many doubles. Um, and this is just one other kind of, of story you can pull from that particular data set. Um, another map not from a ready-made data set. Uh, there's a General Mills plant just outside of downtown on Kelly Island, which is not an island, it's a peninsula, uh, an area called Silo City, which is peppered with grain elevators, some still in use, many defunct. Uh, grain elevators were invented in Buffalo, and another thing made in Buffalo is Cheerios, lots and lots of Cheerios. Uh, and when they make the Cheerios, there's just the most heavenly aroma. Um, I was thinking, oh, it's undescribable. It smells like Cheerios, but it's really nice. Um, and this was sort of funny field work. Now, I, I don't live in Buffalo. I live in Washington, D.C. And during my, my visits to Buffalo for research, uh, the Cheerios weren't being made. Uh, so my cousin and her husband, Chelsea and Keith, went out and did the field work. And they went out a couple of days and tracked where they could, where they couldn't smell the cereal, where it was strong, what the wind direction was like, the temperature, the, the time of day, all of this information um, was compiled into this map of, on a given day, if they're making Cheerios, where you can smell it. Um, and that's another kind of unique to Buffalo thing. Um, so you may have noticed that these maps all have a very similar aesthetic. Uh, and that's not an accident, it is one book. Uh, it'd be weird if they didn't, but this is the third in the series. Uh, and the cartographers and designers that came before me, Evan Tukowski for Cleveland, uh, Alex B. Hill for Detroit, and David Wilson, the creative director at Belt, um, did a lot of the heavy lifting on that. Um, David Wilson's just a brilliant designer. He just did these um, Rust Belt Arcana tarot cards. Um, there's a lot of illustrations, and he put together this style guide. Uh, and it's a cohesive set of colors and type and other details that make sure that each book in the series uh, speaks the same language. But when you look at, at Alex's maps and Evan's maps and Vicky's maps, you can tell who made them obviously by the content. Uh, but if we're all speaking the same language, you can see we've kind of, we've got different accents, different dialects, different ways of taking this series style and interpreting it in such a way that we've got our own individual voices. And this is the, the same, um, HOLC redlining data set, interpreted three different ways. Um, and this is something I've been thinking a, about a lot lately, is how does one develop and define one's own cartographic voice? And I talked to a couple of folks around NASIS uh, yesterday to see how they would describe their cartographic voice. And it's such a deliberately vague prompt with such a variety of answers. Um, and it kind of speaks to how cartography is both very personal and very universal. Uh, and that's something I really want to explore in the future, but I do only have 15 minutes, so let's move it along. Uh, when it comes to my own maps, I think my, my voice is kind of whimsical. And this is maybe a response to the sort of bleak subject matter uh, of the work in my day job. Um, or maybe I'm just kind of cheerful. Let's not overthink it. Um, could go either way. But you can see my cartographic voice through things like never a straight line arrow, always a little swoopy, a lot of layered opacity. Um, even with the type limitations, the spe specific fonts required in this series, why not put something at a, at a jaunty angle or just something a little, a little unusual or unexpected? Um, but another way you speak in your cartographic voice is through the content choices. Uh, and here is kind of a clumsy blend of deep thoughts about who we are as cartographers and American football. Um, the greater intention behind all of my work is to answer a question while raising a new one. And this example is goofy on its face. It's, are the Buffalo Bills cursed? And answering that, when you hear that question, you don't think, ah, a map, that's the way to answer this. But there's a cemetery in the parking lot. It's small, 
I don't know of any horrible demons interred within, but its presence necessitated the stadium to be built not on the north-south axis as originally planned, but on a closer uh, east-west angle, um, which Buffalo is at the western end of Lake Erie. So you get these winds whipping off the lake and entering the stadium bowl and like, yeah, it's nice. It keeps your, your beer pretty cold if you're in the upper decks, but <laughs> It affects the trajectory of the ball uh, when it's thrown or kicked in kind of unpredictable ways. So this, this one map that's kind of goofy on the surface, you do get a real sense of how the natural and built environments interact with real world consequences. Um, but Buffalo is so much more than a punchline football team or chicken wings or a shooting in 1901 or a shooting in 2022. Buffalo is the city of good neighbors. It's the queen city of the lakes. It's the nickel city. And my favorite of the nicknames is the city of no illusions, uh, which is a term, uh, an, a motto, uh, nickname, coined in 1977 by local artist Michael Morgulis. Um, this iconic image, iconic in Buffalo, I guess, uh, a lone bison with snowflakes circled by the phrase, um, plays out the title of Ursula K. Lugin's 1967 novel, City of Illusions. And to quote, Morgulis, wouldn't you rather live in a place without illusions? That is, someplace real? And although the, these all together, these maps, this book, the stories contained within, this is what I want to convey. Welcome to Buffalo, someplace real. Thank you. Thank you.